Talking about dual homing uh, for the um, Apache traffic control uh, CDN. Um, so basically on agenda, we're gonna have um, just some historical background of uh, how deployments have been happening uh, at Comcast for this, um, some requirements for this project, um, overview of uh, what we decided to do, some detailed design, um, and a little demo. Um, yeah, so um, historically, um, about 10 years deploying um, Apache traffic control caches at Comcast, they went into data centers where they connected to a single uh, switch uh, or router, um, and they uh, used the uh, link aggregation um, so that worked out rather well. Um, those um, data center routers didn't need to be rebooted very often. Um, so there were no issues with um, with that. Um, what um, end up, ended up happening, though, is that we started deploying um, caches to um, uh, sites, uh, what we call hub sites. Right, and within those hub sites, this is where you would have your residential um, internet uh, connections and cable modem termination systems and so forth. Uh, within those hub sites, we had uh, two RERs, uh, what we called uh, residential U-ring routers, um, and uh, we would connect to one of them um, again with two cables and using lag. So that created that uh, created a bit of a problem because um, most of the equipment within a hub site was uh, already dual homed. So um, network engineering would go ahead and take um, uh, these RERs um, out for maintenance um, whenever they felt like it because um, the customers uh, that were, would be connected to them would not see any interruptions. For us, though, it created uh, an issue since uh, we would have... Um, even so, the CDN does have uh, you know, health uh, monitors and stuff like that, so we can direct clients away from uh, caches that are about to go down. But we also had sticky clients, which would stick to a particular server, um, and there's no way to basically remove them. So when uh, finally that uh, router um, would go away, um, the clients would see errors and have to reconnect. So how do we solve this problem? You know, since we do have uh, two uh, of these RERs per hub site, you know, we thought, why not connect to both of them, right? Um, yeah, so the objective here is was to simply increase availability, uh, reduce maintenance, um, leverage internet address flexibility. So this is talking about um, having your, own, um, your virtual IP addresses. Um, and ease installation of new servers. Um, obviously, there are some drawbacks to making changes in this area, which would make um, the control plane more complex, and you can have some harder debug situations, obviously. Um, we looked at several technologies to accomplish this, um, namely um, BGP pairing, um, multi-router link, uh, multi link aggregation, or MLAG, um, and also just simple um, active passive failover. Um, there are some other requirements um, that we wanted to um, keep in mind. We wanted to make sure, obviously, that we terminate um, our connections on two different network nodes. Um, we wanted to make sure that um, we don't require any additional state protocol or control plane between the network nodes. Um, we wanted to be, make sure that the cache is able to utilize both links at the same time. Um, that link failure is transparent to clients. That um, caches should not exceed half the available bandwidth. That basically it's a planning assumption, right? This basically means if you have um, uh, 
two X of a certain bandwidth, then if uh, half of that bandwidth goes away because of your uplink failure, you want to be, make sure that all that your traffic is able to fit within the other link. Um, and uh, basically we wanted to make sure that um, all of this um, happened automatically. Uh, link failover would not require any human intervention on our side. So um, we uh, decided to use BGP pairing um, between the cache and the routers um, on both of the interfaces to accomplish this. Um, in so basically, that means that um, the, the cache server is able to tell the router, hey, I have um, a V4 or a V6 uh, VIP available on this link. And uh, any client that wants to get to that IP address um, can, can come and access me um, on that link. Um, so that, that kind of has a built-in health protocol, right? If, if the link uh, goes away, the BGP session breaks. Um, and you can get to the to that link. Um, there's no 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 clients are getting uh, forwarded to the link anymore. Um, so, uh, yeah, the other uh, so kind of solution was to require the network uh, to send us a default route, a preferred route. Um, sometimes um, one of the links is preferred. Sometimes both of the links are preferred, but we um, required. Uh, default route, and more more on that later. Uh, from a networking standpoint, um, so basically at the bottom here, we see our autonomous system, which is um, of um, 65,000 range, which is your private autonomous system range. Um, that's um, the, the cache is sitting up here, has two connections um, of 100 gig each, but I mean, any kind of speed would work. Um, the connections are protected um, with uh, BFD, which is uh, basically a protocol that allows BGP to detect um, link down conditions faster. Um, both of the connections are set up with their own local IP addresses. Um, in addition to that, you can see this arrow. This is basically indicating uh, that we're um, sending, the cache is sending out the unicast VIP address um, and also receiving that default route that I just talked about uh, from the, the rest of the network. Um, so these are the our two routers that we're directly connected to. Um, and they're propagating this uh, VIP to the rest of the internet, which is basically rep represented here by these aggregating routers and the backbone internet uh, iBone that uh, that's the, the Comcast link go for that um, like I said we have each cache um, within Comcast right now comes with 100 gig interfaces uh, connected to the two different routers uh, both of the connections are configured with their own IPS and that's basically required to build um, the BGP um, relationship between the cache and, and the router. But it's also useful for maintenance, right? You, you want to be able to get into the router without, uh, into, the, into the server without having the BGP stuff already up. And um, you want to basically be able to stay out of management connections and so forth and just use some way to get into the server um, if, if you know, fix something or set something up. Um, both links uh, are configured with um, LACP. Um, even so, there's only one um, link within e each uh, LACP bundle. Um, and that basically allows uh, for um, software link down detection by the OS uh, using the LACP protocol um, instead of having to rely on the um, NIC driver to, to determine that we have the OSCP to tell us that the link goes down um, and um, we have um, loopback um, 
so this, and then we have uh, virtual IP addresses assigned to loopback um, to the loopback interface on the cache. So that happens during net install, uh, which by the way uses um, a different um, open source component called uh, 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 TC uh, netconfig. Um, that uh, there was a basically was, there was a presentation on this um, during prior Apache cons. If you wanted to uh, learn more about that, um, so basically um, uh, we have the OS uh, booting up, and uh, for CentOS seven, um, there's one default route uh, that is created, right? And that's basically prior to all the BGP stuff. Um, once um, the BG, uh, our bird BG is, um, is set up and started, um, that default route is propagated from our BGP neighbors um, into, basically it's received by bird, and then bird propagates us into the Linux uh, kernel routing. Um, then the CDN traffic monitors, um, are able to access the virtual IP address and establish that the, the cache is actually healthy. Um, then simply um, the CDN traffic router is able to um, direct clients to this IP address. Um, so that's still the VIP, not the not the actual interface uh, IP addresses. Um, there was a further require uh, refinement um, that was needed here um, due to basically us having been limited to CentOS 7 for now in our deployment. Um, CentOS 7 is sort of uh, counterintuitive from a networking standpoint of view in that um, it's not able to adjust its routing table based on link availability. It sounds strange, but CentOS 7 will actually try to uh, send packets to a link that's down. Um, so to fix that, uh, we have um, BERT and BGP tell us the default interface uh, to use as for the, def you know, the default route. But even prior to that, uh, so that we don't get into um, issues where um, the, the system boots up and somehow one of the links failed um, and uh, we don't have BERT and BGP yet, uh, we still would like to access the system. And to do that, uh, we use additional routing tables uh, per interface, right? Um, it, it sounds like kind of networking magic, but it, it's not. So I'm going to just give you an example of, of how that's done. Um, so uh, to use these additional uh, routing tables, we have we need to use additional IP rules. Um, And so here we have the IP rules are very simple. Um, if the packet if the packet is originating from an IP address assigned to bond zero, I'll look up how to route it using the bond zero routing table. If it's originating from bond one, look up how it's done, how, how to do it and how to route it uh, using the bond one routing table. And the, the routing tables are very simple. This is basically just says, hey, use the default interface. Um, and that's, that's that. There's nothing, nothing more to it. The only other kind of slightly different thing that we, is going on is that uh, once everything boots up and you have uh, BIRD and BGP, um, BIRD is receiving um, that default route. So this is the default route. Um, here, you can see that it's assigned to bond uh, zero. Uh, it's coming from protocol BIRD uh, with matrix one. So that means it's taking precedence. And that's what's being used for the VIP, right? Once um, before all of this, if, if uh, the VIP wasn't around, all of this stuff was not around, you would use the default um, route that's just uh, created during boot up and it's created with the, with the lower matrix. Well, that's not actually ever used uh, once the system is fully operational. Uh, 
Um, so this is our favorite eye chart part of the presentation. Um, I'm just going to go really quickly through a scenario where we have a server that's represented by these two middle columns, right? And um, it's peering to the routers on the left side, and we have some clients on the right side, right? In the beginning, uh, we have um, both of the um, connections are up and active, um, and they're basically um, connect. You know, they're peering with uh, the routers. The router is sending a default um, route with the med. Um, the OS selects the best route based on, on the med value, um, and then. Yeah, so then basically clients can request uh, content from that virtual IP address. Um, in this particular case, uh, so the routers are um, propagating um, routing that um, requests the nearest um, um, available VIP, right? And in this particular case, is our, it's our uh, connection number one. Um, then we have. Um, Apache traffic server service request. Uh, Apache traffic server then will use the VIP to talk to an origin if you need to. Um, and then we will reply back to um, the client. Uh, the packet gets routed by um, via the default gateway, right, that we just got from the BGP um, and back out to the client. So, what happens when that connection goes away? You know, let's say somebody tripped over the cable, or that particular router is is doing some sort of maintenance. Um, so when that happens, um, you basically the route disappears um, from the route disappears from the all the network routing tables. So the next time. Um, uh, the a client is requesting content. It's actually it's being uh, propagated, routed to the other connection, right? The other connection is still up. It still has the same virtual IP address, um, and everything proceeds um, normally. You know, there's no interruption to the client. And I'll demo this um, in a second. Um, yeah, so let's go look at how this happens um, in, in our lab. So um, basically, we have uh, I have a video on a so basically the server. This is um, a traffic portal. Um, as part of uh, Apache Traffic Control, this is my server being um, basically my service page. Um, here, I'm able to um, create several different connections, right? Interfaces. Um, our loopback interface contains the VIP. So, this is the VIP IP. Uh, the gateway doesn't matter here, it's not used. So, I just put in the same IP address. Um, the important part is that um, this is service address is checked. That's basically signifying that the health monitor will attempt to connect to this specific IP address to get the health off the cache. Um, then we have um, the IPs for the other two connections. Um, so this is just the two bonds. Bonds one is a just a regular um, IP address assigned to it with a gateway and default gateway. Same for um, bond zero. The important part here is that um, this monitor, this interface is checked. So that's because of, of basically how um, uh, packet counters work in Linux. In Linux. Um, the loopback interface just doesn't count packets properly. Um, only certain packets are counted. Um, so we need to actually look at packet counters on the on the physical interfaces instead of the, the virtual one, the loopback one. Um, 
So um, I define this information there, and then um, I'm able to use TC netconfig to um, install an ISO that will talk to um, traffic portal, get all this stuff, uh, configure um, the uh, networking on the server, then Ansible will, will come in and install BERT, start it up, and everything in these VIPs should, be, uh, should pop up basically as available on the network. Um, in this particular case, um, I have uh, Apache uh, traffic uh, server installed on my server, um, and it's uh, you know playing a sample video. Um, the interesting part happens when you start unplugging. Um, um, so, which I'll just do right now. Um, so here, I'm just going to disable one of them. And hopefully the video still plays. Yeah, so it's still playing. Uh, let's disable the other one so that I can prove to you that I'm not, it's not cached somehow. Um, other interface is disabled now, so the system is completely unreachable. And you can see the video is not loading. So what we're going to do now, we're just going to come back and re-enable one of the interfaces. Um, so what will happen here is that the interface will go up. Um, the BGP speakers on the, the router and on the host will start talking to each other. Uh, the host will say, hey, I have a VIP address. It's available here. Um, the, the router will say, hey, I have a default route for you. Here you go. Um, then once the route propagates the rest of the network, we should be able to see our video again here. So usually it takes uh, about 10 seconds or so. All right. Yeah, so that's that's how long it took for the other connection to be established and the, the VIP to propagate through the network. Um, and that's basically, um, it concludes my demo. Um, um, the other kind of, um, the, the more interesting stuff is going to come in future work, right? So, um, which I'm, I'm really excited about. In the future, um, since you can have, um, you know, with this approach, you can have not one, but multiple VIPs assigned to multiple servers. Um, and the servers themselves will be able to um, function as load balancers, right? So if you, a server says, hey, I have this IP address, a certain amount of traffic gets directed to it. And um, if, if uh, the control plane basically decides, hey, uh, you have a little bit too much trick, um, then the server can say, okay, well, this IP is not no longer available, and the clients will be seamlessly steered to other um, other servers. Um, so that's just kind of like one of the applications of Anycast. Uh, obviously, the other one it would be traffic localization, um, so that we can. Um, refine our, our localization that uh, we currently use um, to to basically use uh, the network, right, to, to route packets to the nearest server. Um, and that's all I had. Um, let's see if we have any um, questions. So Eric is asking, uh, when using two interfaces, what interface bandwidth does the traffic monitor see for the host? Um, so basically, the traffic monitor will check uh, packet counters for both of the interfaces. Um, so 
they they're basically summed. So bond zero and bond one uh, summed together, um, and compared to um, parameters that are set up for the server. Uh, does that answer your question? All righty. Um, so it looks like I'm. If we got a little bit of time. Early by yeah. 15 minutes? You, 135. Yeah, you got about 12 minutes. Um, if there's any other questions, let's. Was I muted that whole time? Yeah, I can hear you. So it looks like we have about 12 minutes. If there's any other questions, let's get them in now. Um, otherwise, Sergey, that was awesome. I know that there's a lot of uh, excitement around this feature. Um, so, yeah. yeah, I mean, um, in terms of uh, man hours that we're going to hoping to save in terms of our ops, I mean, it's hundreds of man hours basically per, uh, per year that's basically spent on monitoring um, uh, the, our uplinks. Um, if we don't have to do it, we, we don't have to worry about it. It's going to spend us, send us a lot of time and improve reliability. So it's the main drivers here. Cool. <clears throat> All right. Well, I don't see any more questions coming in. So. Um... Again, thank you for, for the presentation, Sergey. Great job. And if anybody does come up with a question, um, you can always feel free to ask in Slack. All right. Yep. Thanks. See you. All right. See you.